is that number one, you tar everybody with the same brush, right? There's no nuance. There's no ability to look inside Israel and realize that, you know, the opinion polls say 70% of the Israeli population don't like Netanyahu, right? And that's not reflected by the call. And I think it's important to realize is that it allows people in Israel who are, you know, of the Netanyahu strain, who are more radical, who are more sort of nationalist, it allows them to paint this picture of no one likes us, we don't care. This Millwall thing, right? And it, and it, allow, it allows them to say, hey, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter that we're not, you know, that we don't feel that we have to listen to what the world says because the world doesn't like us. We're on our own, right? I think if you actually want peace, and you actually want to get to a stage where, you know, two people can live in harmony and, you know, not be throwing rockets and, and terrorist attacks at each other. You need to find the elements of Israeli society that are more open to peace and, and encourage and support them instead of just boycotting all of them. And I would say that music, like in every other country, is a more liberal part of Israeli society. And to ignore that and to shun them and to push them away makes it seem like there's no benefit to them trying to be open to the world and trying to listen to what the world has to say. So Jeffrey, the idea of a boycott is too blunt an instrument. No, I don't, I, I, I don't think it is too blunt an instrument because I think also it's really important to remember what instruments do we have available to us because I think it's interesting as you're sort of talking about it, Josh, Israel as a state has lots of support from governments, from different organizations and institutions. So it is not necessarily that Israel is isolated. Part of the reason this conflict has gone on for so long is because it, it, Israel has lots of support from various governments and heads of state. And I think the boycott is important because it's part of putting pressure on those governments and organizations to create change to, you know, from my perspective, put forward a ceasefire, release the hostages, ultimately, I think, ending arms sales to Israel from countries that are doing that. So I'm Canadian, you know, the Canadian protests around this eventually led the government to stop selling arms to, uh, to Israel that we used in the conflict. So I think, I think boycotts are also something that I think one is how much do we have as people, but also there's a, there's a really powerful history of boycotts being successful. So, you know, in England, one of the first recorded boycotts was around sugar and how when England failed to abolish slavery, um, people start, stopped buying sugar that was made um, by slaves. And the sales went down by about a third to a half because people were now buying sugar that was made from quote unquote free men, I think was the term at the time. But you can also look at um, apartheid South Africa, um, Montgomery, Alabama with Rosa Parks. Like boycotts are really powerful instruments that people use to create change. And oftentimes they're some of the only um, options we have because political leaders and institutions are not listening to us. But isn't it, isn't it complicated in this situation? Because as we're just hearing, um, when it comes to Eurovision, you're talking about basically boycotting an artist, a songwriting team, and the public broadcaster. It's actually, it's, it's kind of at arm's length from what, what the government or the state is doing. But I think part of cultural boycotts is that they can be a part of eventually sort of getting to those governments to create change. So, you know, within the UK right now, I know Oli Alexander, who's performing uh, for us, he is now coming under pressure. There have been open letters signed uh, trying to get him to resign from his position. So I think it's about putting the people at various points under pressure that they can then put governments under pressure. So it's, it's not necessarily that A gets to B immediately. It might be that A has to go to B to C to D, but ultimately I think the aim of what's happening to your point is it's some form of cooperation and peace and harmony, right? Like, what people want to see is they want to see peace in, in the Middle East. Josh? Yeah, I, 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 I slightly slightly disagree with the fact that the, 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 the doing this is, is, is ending up in, in a sort of thing that will lead to peace, right? I, I think the answer to this is, is more dialogue, right? It's not, it's not shutting people off. And, and to your point about, you know, maybe the Israeli government will take notice i can i can assure you that the israeli government does not does not care that that's not my personal view i just i think that they're probably worried about other things and i think they already think that the world doesn't like them and this is just another example of that um look, i think it's a it's well a, i mean the british government position has changed mm -hmm. and it's changed in response to to british public opinion changing i would argue that and this is just another example of british public opinion yeah, look, I would actually argue that the change in the British government's position has probably been more informed by events on the ground than by um, by public opinion. I think, you know, if you look at the protests that happened which I, the day after October 7th, before Israel had even started um, retaliating against Gaza, the, the demands of those protest movements hasn't changed. The reality on the ground has changed and the government has, you know, made different decisions based on that. I, I, you know, maybe they are listening. I, I, I think it's probably more complicated than that. 
and Jeffrey, just just back to the kind of the nature of, of how boycotts work. I mean, is there is there another way of doing this where you could you could watch Eurovision, but I don't know, like do something when the Israeli song came on? Because I just think that because there's different degrees of boycotting this, and you and when it comes to Eurovision, you've picked like the extreme one, haven't you? I, I I don't know if it's the extreme one. So like I have two friends who are go who I believe are still going to go to Malmo. It's one of their birthdays, and they're sort of saying, you know, we won't cheer when Israel performs. But I think fundamentally that misses the point as to watching a country perform. And as as we sort of spoken about and has been mentioned, you know, Eurovision and presenting themselves on a world stage is really important to them. It's important to all the countries that compete. That's sort of why they do it. And so to be able to present a vision and a performance of a country that that the response there gets to be no response from the Palestinian people where and I think that's important because we can contrast that with the Russian invasion, and I'm not saying two conflicts are the same, no two conflicts are the same. But if we look at the way in which the Ukrainian people were able to be um, shown the, the amount of support that was given to their performers, but also, you know, there was a performance that I think Rebecca Ferguson did in last year's show, and it was sort of like how people took homes for U Ukrainian people, there would be nothing of that for Palestinian people. So how can we watch a program where that is so one-sided, and that there will be nothing showing the suffering of, you know, 30,000 people are sort of are dead in Gaza at the moment. Where is that? Where are their voice? Okay, Josh, there's two things there. There's representation for the Palestinian people in Eurovision across time. There isn't there isn't an entry and of course it's Palestinian statehood is a very complicated yeah, concept. Yeah. Um I, 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 yeah, I'm not sure how many different entries you'd need to represent the different bits of, of, of the Palestinian people. But do you think there should a way should have been found by now to let that that community be represented in this competition. I think if you if you take what the EBU says at face value, right, then that means no politics at all. And the, 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 what they um, said that that means is that they they censored they censored and they rewrote Israel's version, and they probably won't make any mention of the conflict at all. Well, they didn't censor it, did they? Well, they rejected it and caused it to be a rewrite. I would say that that's a, they enforced the self censorship, right? Or just enforced the rules. Sure, fine. They okay, enforced anyway, the sorry. rules. But is, should a way have been found by now so that Palestinian people could be represented at Eurovision? No, I think that's... Irrespective of what's happening this year. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that's a decision for the EBU, and I think that's a... It's obviously a conflict that touches a lot of people. It's it's something that affects every, every everybody that's invested in it. And I think the reason why they probably haven't and they probably won't is because they could do it and it'll be criticised and then the, the Israelis will say they want more and I think it's probably... They've judged it safer to just not include it at all. Okay, and is there a way that you raise a song contest, the actual shows, whether it's the semi-final or the final or the halftime show or the introduction, that they could reflect what's happening between Israel and Gaza in a way that, that, that you could live with, that everyone could live with, <laughs> both sides could live with? Yeah, I'm sure that, that there's, you know, there's there's ample opportunities. I'm sure there's artists that would be more than happy to perform. I think that's a, that's a question for them and whether they, whether they want to. I mean, I, I personally would have no problem with that. Jeffrey, is there something the organisers of Eurovision could do that could assuage you that wouldn't necessarily be kicking out Israel but might be more reflecting the reality you see? I think fundamentally, unless they're willing to ban Israel, I don't see there a way forward for them to sort of right this wrong. Okay, right. Now, as we've been hearing, this isn't the first time Eurovision has been caught up in controversy. We wanted to understand a bit more about the history of the competition's political connections. And we found, as I predicted earlier, just the man. <laughs> My name is Dean Vuletic. I'm a historian of contemporary Europe, currently lecturing at the University of Luxembourg. And I'm the author of the book, Post-War Europe and the Eurovision Song Contest. So, first of all, what political or geopolitical or economic or soft power benefits does a country get from being in Eurovision? Well, there are so many different advantages that countries have seen Eurovision as giving them throughout history. Uh, some sort of acceptance in the West European world. For example, at a time when they were trying to whitewash their international images, here I can give you the example of the right-wing regimes of Spain, Portugal and Greece during the Cold War. Other countries have seen it as an opportunity to promote their aspirations for European integration, their aspirations to enter the European Union, even though the European Broadcasting Union and the European Union aren't connected. Right, people are talking about a boycott because of Israel. 
when has there been a boycott threatened because of a participant before? When, when was the first time that might have happened? Well, the first time a boycott happened was in 1969 when Austria uh, refused to attend uh, the Eurovision Song Contest that was being staged in Madrid because it opposed the right-wing dictatorship of General Francisco Franco. Okay, when's the next big geopolitical kind of scandal after that in quote marks? The first big diplomatic scandal in Eurovision really occurred in the mid-1970s and it reflected the political tensions between Greece and Turkey at the time over the Turkish invasion of Cyprus, which occurred in 1974. Now, Greece debuted in Eurovision in 1974, and Turkey debuted in Eurovision in 1975. And when Turkey debuted, Greece boycotted the contest because of Turkey's participation. And then in 1976, when Greece sent a song that commemorated the victims of the Turkish invasion, then Turkey boycotted Eurovision. So there we see really the first big diplomatic scandal and the first big uh, tit-for-tat boycotts in Eurovision occurring in the mid-1970s. Okay, so well that raises the prospect then of, of songs that were deemed to have political content. Where does that story go next? Well, funnily enough, in 1976, Turkish television wrote a letter to the European Broadcasting Union saying, look, the Greek song is political, it has uh, political lyrics, and it should therefore be banned from the contest. And the European Broadcasting Union wrote back and said, there are actually no rules in the contest preventing songs with political lyrics from being performed, so Greece is allowed to go ahead and enter Eurovision with that song. Okay, and then did that lead to the introduction of rules about political songs? Well, no. We had to wait until the year 2000 when such a rule, or let's say the seed of such a rule, was really put into the rules of the Eurovision Song Contest. When a line was introduced saying that songs should not bring the contest 